Hey everyone and welcome to today's video. So I'm not going to spend too much time with this intro because I already know it's going to be a really long video. I read a lot in March. Um, in terms of page count, I don't actually know because some of the books were quite short. Please let me know in the comments if you guys would prefer shorter discussions on each book and just cramming all the books into one video or would you prefer videos where I spend more time talking about each book I've read but less books within that video. So if I read a lot in a month, I could do two parts to my wrap up, even three if I've read a lot. So let me know what you guys prefer. If you prefer the shorter videos with longer discussions versus just having all the books discussed in one video. Um, I would really like to know what your preferences are. So I'm just gonna get started talking about the books that I read in March. Somehow I read 22 books, which is usually a sign that I am stress reading. <laughs> so I am not really paying attention to my more immediate responsibilities such as studying for exams and I'm stress reading. It does help that some of the books were quite short though. So I'm gonna start with the lowest rated book and then work my way up to my favorite book of the month. It's something I like to do. I like to start off getting the less enjoyed books out of the way and then finishing the video with my favorites. So my least favorite book of March is the Sevastopol Sketches by Tolstoy. This is one of his shorter books. It's almost like a diary, but it's like a fictionalized account of Leo Tolstoy's own experience visiting the city of Sevastopol during the Crimean War. So I've read Tolstoy's major novels. I've read War and Peace, Anna Karenina, and Resurrection. And while I enjoyed War and Peace and Anna Karenina immensely, what I did not like about War and Peace was the extensive uh, discussions on just the war and all the military jargon and everything. I just wasn't the biggest fan. And so I was going into this book knowing that it would be more war heavy, kind of the way War and Peace was. Unfortunately, I did not find any of the characters interesting. I even spent some time learning about the Crimean War and the specific siege of Sevastopol to kind of prepare myself for the story. And I just wasn't enjoying it. I wasn't getting into it. I just don't find it very enjoyable to read about someone walking through war zones and they're recording their, you know, what they're seeing and whatever it may be. It's just not something I'm drawn to personally. In terms of Tolstoy's other short stories, if any of you are familiar with any that are not war heavy and have more to do with, I guess, like domestic scenes, I think that's something I'd enjoy a lot more. So please do let me know if you know of any. Next up, we have Silas Marner by George Eliot. And this is another one that I only gave two stars to. I really, really did not enjoy it as much as I was hoping to. Um, I think part of it has to do with George Eliot's writing style. It was a little bit difficult to get used to. And honestly, I found the story to be really, really forgettable. Like I don't remember much of what happens. Um, I do remember though that we have a man named Silas Marner who ends up moving to this new town. So he had previously lived in another town, but due to some things that had happened, he ended up moving to a town called Ravalo and there he's just a linen weaver and he's kind of, you know, a lonely man. He doesn't really um, talk to people. He doesn't really, he just doesn't do much. Like his life seems pretty, pretty dull. Um, that is until he ends up finding a little, I think she was a toddler when he found her, but her mother had died, this little girl, and um, he takes her in, kind of adopts her, and that's basically what the story is. There's some other like minor plot lines going on with side characters that I did not find interesting at all. Um, but yeah, there are some pretty awful goings on in the town and Silas is his life just seems to be full of like unfortunate events happening one after another but I just wasn't attached to him as a character I didn't find him very compelling and yeah as I was reading I was just kind of like looking forward to the story being over I just wasn't enjoying it at all it just did not live up to my expectations unfortunately I 100% will read other books by George Eliot though because I have heard that this is generally not as well loved as her other books such as Middlemarch and uh, Daniel Deronda, Adam Bede, things like that. So yeah, this just wasn't for me. This next book I also gave two stars to and I think there are a couple more that I did and kind of sucks but it is what it is. I was kind of stepping outside of my comfort zone with certain books and not everything was a hit. So this next book was a thriller and I don't think I'll ever learn 
that thrillers just are not for me, at least like the traditional mystery thriller that isn't necessarily a cozy murder mystery with like darker elements. If it's just a thriller, I just end up not really enjoying it. And that's the case for The Last Thing He Told Me by Laura Dave. So we have this man named Owen who recently married a woman named Hannah and she ended up kind of joining his family. It was just him and his 16 year old daughter from his previous relationship. And so Hannah and his daughter Bailey just don't have, I guess, the best of relationships. And one day Owen disappears. He was seen kind of running through Bailey's school in a hurry, trying to get some message passed on to her. Owen's boss is arrested by the FBI. There seems to be something very fishy going on. There's this like hinting at, oh, Owen isn't really who he said he was. And so Hannah and Bailey team up to, I guess, figure out what happened to him, why he disappeared. And I did not like it. I don't know, just the way this book ended, I found really silly. The mystery was very, very unsurprising to me. And I don't know, I was I was just kind of left like, that's what happened, okay. Well, I wasted a whole book just to figure this out. That's That's great, but that's okay. I'm sorry if this is a book you love. It's just not for me. And I really need to learn to stop reading this genre if it's not something I enjoy but I'm always, always drawn in by the premise. The premise hooks me, I want to know what's gonna happen, and then I am often disappointed. So the last book that I gave two stars to is one that I was highly anticipating. I was super excited to read it because the first two books in this trilogy I gave five stars to, and I loved the characters, I loved the mysteries, I loved everything about the first two books. So I was going into this third book expecting to absolutely adore it, and I did not. Spoiler alert, I really, really did not. And that is As Good As Dead by Holly Jackson. Oh, okay, okay. The first two books were so good. The mysteries were so good. This book, I don't know what the heck happened. It's like we went from two books that blew me away. The twists were phenomenal. The foreshadowing was done expertly like it was so well done there was just enough foreshadowing without things being given away and things being made way too obvious not the case with this book i found everything to be extremely obvious and it's like the writing style was a bit different it's, it was just so so different i don't even it's it's as if another author wrote this book secondly the main character pip is suffering from I'm saying, I would say post-traumatic stress disorder. She went through a lot in the first two books. And in this book, not only is she suffering with mental health problems, but she is also being stalked. And so there's a mystery with who is stalking her. There's another mystery she's trying to figure out that's um, years old. And it's just, these are all interconnected, but the way that Pip copes in this book is extremely extremely unhealthy okay my thoughts feel really jumbled up right now because i'm really frustrated with this book so the first half was enjoyable i was really curious as to what was going on um all these clues were being given it's like multimedia so we have emails we have text messages we have um pictures of i guess like clues as to who the stalker is um it's it's fun i really enjoy that kind of multimedia aspect in the series but then after the midway point i was just like what what that's how this book is gonna go that's the direction it's gonna go in okay that's weird that's not what i was expecting for a book like this and it's not unexpected in a good way as i was saying there's like a secondary aspect to this book it's like pip has a stalker and then she's also trying to solve this mystery with a serial killer as soon as I hit the halfway point, the biggest red herring was just given to me on a platter. And you know exactly who the serial killer is. I don't know. And I, I've seen other people review this book and also express a lot of frustration because it's like Pip is just a completely different person in this book than she is in the first two. If you have read the first two books, just be aware that the atmosphere is different in this book. Pip just makes a lot of choices that I don't understand. 
considering who she is as a person in the first two books. And yes, like trauma changes people and I completely understand that. But I also think that the way the author chose to finish her story didn't really allow for healing and moving past things that have happened in a healthy way. There's something that I want to touch on and it is a massive spoiler. So spoiler alert, do not watch from here until I finish talking about this book um, because this is a very big spoiler. So Pip killing the serial killer. I personally do not think that she should have gotten off the hook for what she did. There is an aspect of self-defense and I understand that she was, you know, running for her life basically, but she made the decision to go back and kill this man. No matter how despicable he is, no matter the crimes he has committed, this type of like morally gray situations just, they bother me so much. I don't condone cold-blooded murder, no matter what the person has done, I still believe that he should have been in jail. He should have faced the consequences of his actions. She just killed him and, you know, he didn't get to go through a trial. There should have been more justice, you know, I, I don't know. There's just, I'm just not happy with how it ended. I don't agree with what the author decided to do, but tell me if you have read this book and if you disagree, please let me know if uh, you think that Pip acted in, I guess, the world's best interest by getting rid of this terrible human being. So that's as good as dead. Really, really unhappy with it, but that's okay. At least I loved the first two books in the series. And if I ever reread the series, I am not gonna touch this one. I will just reread the first two books because the mysteries are really, really good. Um, don't let my anger towards this book deter you from reading the first two books. I think they are very much worth it. But yeah, that's as good as dead. Next up, we have a book that I gave 2.75 out of 5 to, and that is Spinning Silver by Naomi Novik. I was really disappointed with this book. So 2.75, that rating kind of indicates that there are merits to this book. I think it's extremely atmospheric. I think it's whimsical, and I think it's a really good kind of darker fairy tale that's perfect to read in like the cold months of the year. But I found it to be dry at the same time. I know it's like a complete oxymoron how you can have whimsical writing and yet the story just feels like it's lacking big time. This is my personal opinion. I know a lot of people love this book. This is definitely just a me issue. I just don't seem to be driving with Naomi Novik as an author. I've tried Uprooted and hated that book, got rid of it right after I read it. But this one I was expecting to like a lot more and I guess she's just not the author for me. But just talking a little bit about what this book is about, we have a girl named Miriam who she kind of takes over her family's money lending business. They're facing a lot of financial difficulties. So she's trying to help out by t helping her father with this business. And she is really prideful in her abilities. And she one day brags, oh, I can turn silver to gold. I can do this amazing thing. And she's overheard by the Staric. I think that's how they're pronounced, which is like a group of like Fae. And they're very unsettling they're kind of all white gray it's like they're almost made of ice they're very very unsettling to look at this boast sets her on this journey with the staric and we have some side characters we have the servant girl who ends up working for miriam's family and then we have this other character her father's a nobleman and she is uh betrothed to the human king of the um land and their stories all just intertwine it does eventually come together to create a story that a lot of people seem to like but i did not so i went into this book expecting to feel the same way that i felt when i read the bear and the nightingale which is similar in the sense that the setting is um very cold and very eastern european inspired i was expecting to feel cold and i did i did feel the atmosphere while reading this book but the characters in the bear and the nightingale were a lot more interesting to me than the characters in this book, especially Miriam. She was just very irritating. She had a really bad attitude all the time and 
she just wasn't really fun to follow. The writing style really took away from my enjoyment. Um, I can't really pinpoint exactly what it is, but I just did not love this book. It's a me problem. <laughs> I don't think this book is like objectively bad. It's just not for me and that's okay. But yeah, that is Spinning Silver. Next, I'll go over the books that I gave three stars to. And so first we have The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin. How do I even describe this book? It is weird and so confusing at the beginning. So we have this planet and we have this continent called The Stillness and this world experiences seasons. And the fifth season is basically like the catastrophic, you know, end of the world type of season where just earthquakes happen and just crazy, crazy things happen. People die and it's awful. So the book starts off with this big event happening where the earth is like broken. So there's a person, a creature, a being who breaks the earth and that's the prologue. That's how it starts. The prologue makes no sense and you really do have to read the rest of the book. And then once you finish, you're like, oh, okay, okay. I see what was happening at the beginning. So we have this woman named Esun and she is an origin, which she basically has the ability to manipulate energy that then affects the world around rocks, weather, like whatever it is. It's this magical ability that's really, really looked down upon and heavily, heavily controlled by the capital, by the government in the capital city, basically. And her story begins when she comes home and sees that her son, her little boy was murdered by his own father. It is a really tragic circumstance and this discovery sets her on this journey. She's trying to find her other child, her daughter, who she believes her husband took. Meanwhile, the world is just being destroyed around her and we have other POVs. We have a little girl named Demaya who is also an origin and then she's kind of learning about her abilities. She is taken by a guardian. Um, into the capital city where she is basically trained how to be an origin the way that the world wants them to be. And then we have another person named Cyanite and she is also an origin and she's sent on this mission for the empire. This book was just a lot for me to wrap my head around. I have never read anything like it. So I could have given it a higher rating because the world itself was absolutely fascinating. I think the characters were really interesting. This author's writing is absolutely beautiful. And I think the themes that were discussed in this book are very important. And a lot of them have to do with racism, which I think she did a very good job of portraying. My biggest issue with this book is something that may not bother the majority of people, but really, really bothers me. And that is unnecessary explicit content. I just don't need to read that. I don't need to read every single detail of what goes on behind closed doors. Like I don't need that. And I just think it was taken to another level in this book. It was, it made me extremely uncomfortable. And I personally wish that books came with these types of content warnings rather than just like trigger warnings because this is the type of content that really, really makes me uncomfortable and takes away from my enjoyment of the book. Anyways, moving on. The book is extremely propulsive. And I think that if you are willing to look past certain things, this book is phenomenal. Another reason that I just could not give it a higher rating is because a major, major thing that happens later in the book, like this major reveal was spoiled for me. If you've read the book, you would probably know what I'm talking about. It's okay. This book is still great. And I hesitate to recommend it for some reasons, but if you're into science fiction, I'm definitely not the biggest science fiction reader, um, but I think it was fascinating. But yeah, moving on. <laughs> Next up, we have this book that I was really excited to read and I ended up giving it three stars too as well. Not because it was bad, but because it was just a fun read and not much more. <laughs> And that book is The Lady's Mind by Francine Rivers. So Francine Rivers is an author I consider to be in my top five Christian authors of all time. Her Mark of the Lion series is probably my favorite trilogy ever. But The Lady's Mind is much more lighthearted. It's very much like a palate cleanser type of book for me. So we have a woman named Catherine who is sent from Boston 
by her mom and her stepdad and she sent out to California. It's during the time of the gold rush in the 1800s and she gets to this town where she's supposed to be living. She has this inheritance from her uncle and all the inheritance really amounts to is a shack basically and some equipment for like a newspaper business. She tries to start up this business and she gives off this like attitude of, I can totally survive in the wild west. I don't need a man. I don't need any help. I can do this. Like I'm a strong woman. And this is very characteristic of a lot of Christian fiction books. And sometimes I just kind of shake my head because they're like carbon copy characters. Like they're so similar to each other. But I did like Catherine. I think she was really funny. She had a lot of spunk, but she was also a little more realistic than other characters I've seen, just in how she would approach certain issues. I think that she did have moments when she could have exercised more caution or just used her brain a little bit more, but it was a really fun book. She meets this man named um, Matthias and he owns a saloon and hotel and he's really gruff and the typical like, I don't need a woman, I'm gonna like, uh, fight my attraction to her and it's it's really silly. They were just fun. They were hilarious The banter is what kept me going That's all I can say is if you like books with really funny character banter It's a good book for that. I just I get kind of like annoyed with the typical story where it's like a girl who grew up really really pampered and having everything handed to her on a silver platter and then she has to like, you know deal with the difficulties of living on her own without a servant, without a maid, and it's very familiar. And I did need a bit of a palate cleanser after some books I read this month. So it was fun, it was enjoyable, just not my favorite out of Francine Rivers books. Next up we have another three star read and that is Poems and Prose by Christina Rossetti. This is a collection of her uh, really, really well known and uh, what scholars believe to be her strongest poetry. And then a lot of her like devotions and, and uh, works of fiction and she has some short stories in here. Um, okay, when I started this book, the first few poems really, really captured my attention. I was very, very much, um, I guess like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be great. This is gonna be a great collection of poetry. I think she's gonna be a favorite poet. And then I just kind of got bored. <laughs> I'm really, really picky with poetry and I do prefer poetry that has to do with like nature and the natural world and things like that. And some of them were really, really beautiful. And then the rest, I was just kind of like, okay, I see what she's trying to get across here, but this wasn't as into the poet, the poems um, as I was hoping I would be. There is one poem that I really, really like and it's, um, let me just see where it is. It's entitled The First Spring Day and I think it's really, really um, perfect for like this time of year. So I thought I'd read it. So it goes like this. I wonder if the sap is stirring yet, if wintry birds are dreaming of a mate, if frozen snowdrops feel as yet the sun and crocus fires are kindling one by one. Sing, Robin, sing. I still am sore in doubt concerning spring. I wonder if the spring tide of this year will bring another spring both, both lost and dear. If heart and spirit will find out their spring or if the world alone will bud and sing. Sing hope to me. Sweet notes, my hope, soft notes of memory. The sap will surely quicken soon or late. The tardiest bird will twitter to a mate. So spring must dawn again with warmth and bloom or in this world, or in the world to come, sing voice of spring, till I too blossom and rejoice and sing. I really, really liked that poem. I read it when it was like blizzarding outside and I think it was the first day of spring actually. But yeah, like when it's a poem like that, that just makes me feel the world around me on a deeper level, that's the type of poetry I like. But there were just a lot of really interesting ones that didn't really capture my attention. Like I was actually really hoping to love Goblin Market, but I just didn't. I just, I thought it was a little weird. I actually found her prose to be quite boring for me personally, um, but 
I still think that she is worth checking out. Yeah, that is Poems and Prose by Christina Rossetti. The last book I gave three stars to is The Pale Horse by Agatha Christie. This was a very, very odd book. It was a little bit different than what you would expect from an Agatha Christie. Um, so I don't know how much to say about the book without really giving away a lot of the plot. So um, we have a priest who had just been visiting this woman who was on her deathbed. And she ended up confessing some things to him, but this happens off page, so we don't know what she's saying. And then this priest ends up going and writing down these names that this woman has said on a piece of paper. He hides the paper in his shoe, and so the priest is murdered and he was obviously searched by whoever killed him. His um, coat was all like, you know, ripped and um, it seems that the killer was looking for this piece of paper, but because it was in the priest's shoe, he didn't know to look there. So the police now have this list. The main perspective, his name is Mark Easterbrook, and this is neither a Poirot nor a uh, Marple mystery. This is more of a standalone. And so we have Mark who happens to have a connection to some of the names on this list, although he doesn't even understand why those names are on the list. So that's very odd as to why Mark knows so many of the people on this list. and he basically helps the police um, with this uh, murder. One thing I did not like about this book is the um, aspect with like the occult. I don't like those, you know, witchy practices and that kind of thing. There is this question of like, was this a natural murder? Um, there are other murders that seem to be happening. Like, are they controlled by the dark arts? The reveal at the end was not surprising at all. I didn't figure out every aspect of it, but it was, you know, once you figure it out, you're just like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's just not a favorite of mine by Agatha Christie, unfortunately. And even like Mark as the main character and um, I guess like a lot of what was happening was seen through his eyes. It's just, he wasn't really a compelling character. And I was just, you know, missing um, that charm that she has with a lot of her detectives and I still gave it three stars. Um, the beginning was definitely the most interesting part, um, just not her strongest book in my opinion, but yeah, that's The Pale Horse. I forgot to mention that I actually read that The Pale Horse and a few other mystery books this month for March Mystery Madness. So the theme was two by two, if I'm not mistaken, just I guess because it's 2022. And so I read two by two books, two times two. I read four. I just realized though that I actually read five mystery books in March, um, but four of them were specifically for March Mystery Madness. So just wanted to put that out there. So next up, we have another Agatha Christie that I read in March and that is Cat Among the Pigeons. So this book takes place at a boarding school for girls, for teenage girls called Meadowbank. And uh, we also have another setting that is only featured really at the beginning and it's a fictional country in the Middle East. And there we meet a prince and his English friend and they're trying to smuggle these jewels out of um, the country and the prince is trying to escape, but he ends up killed. So he and his friend were in a plane and their um, attempt at escape was discovered and so they were killed. And then we have some murders occurring in this school and they are obviously connected. And at the beginning of the book, we have these questions like, how is this man trying to smuggle jewels out of you know this country in the Middle East connected to this English boarding school with a bunch of girls who really have nothing to do with the prince from the Middle East. There's nothing else I can say about the plot line without spoiling what goes on in the book. But yeah, we have some really interesting characters. I think their reveal was really surprising to me. I did not call it as usual. Um, I gave this one 3.5 out of five stars. And this one is a Poirot book, although Poirot is only present for like a few pages, basically towards the end of the book. But yeah, I do think the concept of this book is fun. The title really hints at what is going on in the school. There's a cat among the pigeons and um, the students are trying to figure out what's going on. The different school mistresses are trying to figure out what's going on. And it was definitely a fun read and I do recommend this one. So that is Cat Among the Pigeons. Next up, we have a Charles Dickens book that I ended up liking more than I thought I would. I was actually going into it thinking I would be bored out of my mind because I have heard 
very, very mixed things about it. Uh, some people seem to really like it. And then a lot of people that I know to be Dickens fans really did not like this book. And so I went into it with extremely low expectations and I was pleasantly surprised. And that is Barnaby Rudge. This is a book I gave three and a half stars to, which surprised even me. I was expecting to give it like two stars. So at the beginning of the book, we are in a place called the Maypole Inn, and it's basically exactly what it's called. <laughs> it's an inn. And we have these characters. We have John Willett and his son, Joe. We have a bunch of other characters, and they're just, you know, sitting around the fire, sharing stories, drinking beer, just enjoying a cold night by the fire. And we hear a story about the um, landlord of this inn named uh, Mr. Haredale, and we hear a story about his brother, Reuben, who was murdered years and years ago. And so Mr. Haredale is um, basically the guardian of Reuben's daughter, Emma. And we have this murder mystery, basically, that is a big part of the story, although we don't get answers until a bit later in the book. And so these people are all at the inn and this stranger comes in and he seems to be very, very suspicious and he kind of like rides off like a thief in the night. He is seen multiple times throughout the story and he's just a very creepy man. So there's this like gothic element to the story. We then meet a man named Gabriel Varden, who I think is my favorite character in this book. He's just the sweetest man. He also comes across this um, suspicious stranger who we'll just call the highway man. And he also ends up being very important in the story later on. And then we meet the main character, Barnaby Rudge, and he is obviously um, developmentally delayed of in some way. He lives with his mom and his pet uh, Raven. And in true Dickens fashion, we have many, many side characters who I, you know, I can't talk about all of them because this would take forever. But so the first half of this book is really just us getting to know the characters. Very important theme in this book is the um, tensions between Catholics and Protestants. Um, in England during this time. And this book is actually historical fiction. So it takes place in the 1700s. We just have so much going on in the first half of the book. Um, a lot of character development, which I really liked to see. There are some really, really awful characters, some really funny characters as <laughs> Dickens usually has in his books. And then halfway through the book, you jump five years forward without really a smooth transition. Now we are five years later meeting a man named George Gordon, who is credited with starting the Gordon Riots. And that is what the second half of this book is about. And these Gordon Riots were basically fueled by anti-Catholicism and just the hatred towards Catholic people. And the second half of this book really shows how mob mentality is very powerful. And if you just give people, you know, a trigger, um, a cause like in this book, it's anti-Catholicism. You can get people to destroy property. You can get people to commit atrocities. Um, it's really easy, unfortunately, and it's really sad that this was the case and it still is the case today. Um, so we have Barnaby Rudge who throughout this book, he was just kind of, you know, drifting um, through the story and interacting with the different characters. And then he believes that if he joins this mob, um, he's doing a good thing. So he ends up becoming involved in the Gordon riots. And it was just really, really sad to see how he just didn't understand that this was not a good thing. It's so hard to talk about this book and like to summarize the story without just blabbering on and on and on about what goes on. But that's basically all I can say. So we have Barnaby involved in these riots now and the story continues from there. I really enjoyed this. There are some really fun reveals at the end, um, especially to do with like the highwayman from earlier. And just, I like how a lot of the characters' storylines wrapped up. I think it was well done. And yeah, this was a lot more enjoyable to me than I was expecting. So I think it's something you should give a chance to. Um, the second half of the book though is a little bit drier than the first half in my opinion, but I do think that as you grow to care for the characters in the first half, um, the various things that occur later on in the story, you just, you feel a lot more for the characters. Yeah, sorry, I blabbered a little bit on this one, but Barnaby Rudge. <laughs> so this next book I gave 3.75 stars to. It was almost a four star book, just not quite. 
Um, but that is The Curse of the Pharaohs by Elizabeth Peters. This is the second book in the Amelia Peabody series, which is a Victorian mystery, cozy mystery series that takes place for the most part in Egypt. And oh my goodness, are these books so, so fun. So the first book, we basically got to see Amelia meet her future husband and they were in Egypt excavating. There was this murder that occurred and we just got to see her fall in love and it was very, very sweet. And then in this book, she is a married woman, she is a mother, and she ends up asked by an acquaintance to go to Egypt because this lady's husband was murdered and she needs help, I guess, finishing with um, the excavation and then also trying to figure out what happened to her husband. There's another archeologist who was working with this man um, who also went missing. And so Amelia and Emerson um, go to Egypt, you know, to work, but also Amelia being Amelia, she needs to know what happened. So she is thrown into this mystery. There's this ghostly appearance that keeps showing up and the, uh, the locals call her the lady in white. And so again, Amelia's just a curious, curious woman and needs to figure out what's going on. She puts herself in danger, Emerson's in danger and Oh, these books are so fun. I definitely don't think the mysteries are their strong point. I think that if you are interested in reading these books, go into them knowing that the mysteries are not gonna blow your mind, but the characters are hilarious. Amelia and Emerson are probably, they're gonna be in my favorite couples of all time list for sure. They're so funny. They're so fun to follow. That is The Curse of the Pharaohs. The last Agatha Christie that I read in March is 450 from Paddington. And this one I also gave 3.75 stars to. It was my favorite Agatha Christie this month. And this one is a Miss Marple one. So I definitely enjoyed that Miss Marple was a character. In this book, we have a woman named Mrs. McGillicuddy and she's on a train and she looks out her window and there is a train running parallel to hers. And she sees what she believes to be a murder occur. So a man has his back to her and he is strangling a woman to death. And so Mrs. McGillicuddy is actually on her way to visit Miss Marple. And so she gets to Mar Miss Marple's home and tells her all about what she saw. And then the investigation ensues. So Miss Marple basically hires a woman named Lucy to help out with this investigation because she believes that um, the body must have been dumped on this property. And so Lucy ends up working as like a kitchen maid, a housemaid on the property. And Lucy was one of my favorite characters in this book. She's a very, very intelligent woman. And so she puts on her investigating cap and she kind of, you know, helps figure out what's going on. In this house, this big house that Lucy is working in, we have a large family called the Rutherford family. And so we have the old man, he's a widower and he has adult children. And so he's very wealthy. It seems to be the case in a lot of Agatha Christie books I've read. We have um, a wealthy old man and then his kids who it seems like they just want their inheritance. And so we have this list of possible suspects and the story just goes on from there. And I think it was a lot of fun. I did not call the ending as usual. Um, I was definitely surprised. Um, the only thing that I didn't like about this book was that Miss Marple's page time was very, very short. She was there at the beginning of the book and then she was there just a little bit, I guess a little bit in the middle, but then just a little bit at the end as well. Um, I would have liked to see her more, but I did really like Lucy and how she went about um, trying to solve this mystery. So I would recommend this one if you are looking for another Agatha Christie to read and that is 450 from Paddington. Okay, on to all my four star books. So first we have Miracle Creek. And in this book, we have a couple named Young and Pak Yu, and they are from South Korea originally. So they moved to America, basically looking for a better life. And Pak Yu started this um, like alternative medical therapy type thing where it's oxygen therapy. And it's like a out of water submarine type of um, setup. And so um, people with different uh, ailments can come. And so they have like 100% oxygen that they're breathing in. Um, unfortunately, there is a fire which causes an explosion. And so the police believe that this was intentionally caused. And so this book follows the courtroom aspect of the fire. So the mother of one of the children is arrested and believed to be the person who set the fire and killed her own son and killed a couple more people and injured many others who were 
um, around this miracle, miracle submarine is what it's called. And so we follow the courtroom um, procedure basically as it's happening, um, all the evidence is brought forth and I really, really enjoyed this book. I think that the courtroom aspect of it was a lot less boring than I would expect. Like I, I would not generally read a book like this, but the premise just caught my attention and I wanted to give it a try and I really, really ended up enjoying it. We have multiple points of view and um, each character was either in the submarine, around the submarine, they were kind of all witnesses to what had transpired. And so they're all um, basically called to testify as well. And so they all kind of have their own stories, their own side of what happened. And our main characters are Young and Pak Yu, the, hus the wife and the husband. And um, their story is, you know, it really tugs at your heartstrings. They have a 19 year old daughter, I think. And, um, you know, she had a really difficult time when they emigrated to North America. And it really deals with these um, themes of, you know, immigration and how difficult it can be to assimilate and uh, the racism that they experienced. And um, so I didn't really know what to think until about halfway point. And then I think that's when I figured out what had actually happened before the reveal was made. But even though I figured it out before the reveal, I, I don't think it took away from my enjoyment of the book. And yeah, I gave it four stars. I think it's a great thriller, a courtroom thriller, which I've never read before. And yeah, I would definitely recommend. So that is Miracle Creek. The next four star book I read is Mandy by Julie Andrews. And oh my gosh, this was so cute. This was adorable. I'm so glad I read it. Um, so this is about a girl named Mandy who lives in an orphanage and she ends up, you know, she's out exploring one day out in nature and she finds this like old cottage with a really run down garden. It's just all weeds. And Mandy puts it in her head to just fix it and to just, you know, make it her own. And she ends up gardening and just, oh, it's just so cute. Like all Mandy wants is a place that is her own. She just wants something to be her own. She really suffers emotionally from the fact that she doesn't have a true, you know, family. And she meets the people who own this land along the way. And oh my goodness, it's a beautiful story. You should check it out for sure. If you do like books like this, if you do like Anne of Green Gables, um, The Secret Garden, books like that, I think you should check this out. Although it's not quite at the level of Anne of Green Gables, in my opinion, but it's definitely worth the read. Another book I gave four stars to is Six Crimson Cranes by Elizabeth Lim. And this was a highly anticipated book for me. I was really excited to get to it. I had heard it was like a Disney movie in a book and I 100% agree with that. It definitely felt like a Disney movie in a book form. So we have a girl named Shiori who is a princess and in her kingdom, magic is really looked down upon. And so when her magical abilities are discovered by her stepmother, her along with her brothers are all cursed. So Shiori is basically sent into exile. Her brothers are all turned into cranes. And so she is trying to break the curse. And so she's on this journey to break the curse. She ends up living in the kingdom that she was supposed to be queen of. So she was supposed to marry the crown prince and, um, she ends up there. She ends up meeting this crown prince. Nobody knows of her identity. The curse has actually stopped people from being able to recognize her. And so she's in this kingdom um, trying to uh, break the curse. She has this like mission that she's on. Um, there is a dragon friend that she has. She has this paper bird sidekick named Kiki. And oh my gosh, this book is just precious. It is so, so cute. Like many people have said, like a Disney movie in a book. And I definitely recommend it is pure magic and whimsy and I loved it. And I can't wait to read the second book. Next we have Sold Into Freedom by Carol Tauris. And this was another four star read for me. This is early church biblical fiction. And basically we have a girl named Alantia who is um, from Britannia, which is modern day uh, Britain. And she is basically kidnapped by Roman soldiers and uh, taken into Ephesus and then Philippi, if I'm not mistaken. And there she meets a Roman soldier who has experienced a very, very bad injury. And so he can't fight anymore. So he's really upset and, um, you know, just dealing with a lot of his own issues with his family. Alantia comes from a background of paganism. And so she is used by her new owners um, as like a seer or a psychic and they use her abilities 
uh, to profit off of it. And um, basically the story is about Alantia and this Roman soldier named Quinn and their journey discovering grace and discovering um, just who Jesus was. And so they meet Paul along the way and it's a very very short story but i think it accomplished a lot and i do i would say though that the romance was something i did not enjoy actually in this book it was really really fast and convenient um and just tropey but i do think the redemption story that they experience is very beautiful and if you are a fan of biblical fiction i think this is a really good one to try out so that is sold into freedom this next book I was really excited to read and I'm very happy that I ended up giving it four stars to and that is Heidi by Joanna Spirey. And in this book we have a little girl named Heidi and she's five years old and her aunt basically doesn't want to care for her anymore and so she brings her to live with her grandfather in the Swiss Alps. And her grandpa is just a grump. He's not a very um, endearing old man. But it seems that Heidi has a very softening effect on him. And so their relationship is really, really sweet to follow. Heidi is just obsessed with the Swiss Alps. She's obsessed with the goats, the nature, the flowers, the mountains, just everything about this region in the world. And seeing her love of nature was just so inspiring and so, so sweet. Heidi is just such a happy-go-lucky child and she really brings out the best in her grandpa and I loved to see that. One day though she's actually taken to Frankfurt to live with this very wealthy um, family and specifically to be like a companion to the daughter of this this uh, very wealthy man and so she's there she has befriended this girl but even though she does her best to just you know make the best of her life there she's very very unhappy. The governess is an awful human being. If you've read this book Frau Rottenmeier, awful woman, great name though. Frau Rottenmeier is a, a perfect name for this woman, but she's very, very unhappy. And so the father of this girl um, notices that Heidi's not doing so well, her health starts to deteriorate and he does his best to, I guess, ensure that she's happy, but will Heidi ever really be happy if she's not with her grandpa in the Swiss Alps? And story continues from there. It wasn't quite five stars for me, but I do think that it is perfect to read in the springtime. It just has such a beautiful sense of nostalgia and yeah, highly recommend. So these next two books, one of them is a four star read and one is a five star, but I'm going to talk about both of them together because they are the last two books in a series. So we have These Happy Golden Years, which got five stars, and then we have The First Four Years, which got four stars. So These Happy Golden Years is the second last book in the Little House on the Prairie series. We finally get to see Laura and Almanzo fall in love and get married. And that's all that this book really is, is Laura's just matured. She is now a teacher. She's really grown into a beautiful young woman and she falls in love. And that's the book. That's the book for you. I can't really say anything else because there's really nothing else to say. It's like a slice of life. Just watching Laura encounter the difficulties of being a teacher was really fun. And yeah, the romance was really, really cute. And then we have the first four years, which is when they are now married and they're living together um, on their own. And then they have a little girl named Rose. And it's a very short book. Um, I definitely think it ended way too soon and the plot just wasn't as uh, good, but it did get four stars from me. And I'm finally finished the Little House on the Prairie series. I still can't believe it. It is definitely one of my favorite series now. And if you need something lighthearted, but very, very nostalgic, please check out these books. They are precious. So my second favorite book of the month, which got five stars for me, and it is actually a reread. I read it for the first time a few years ago. And that is Thief of Corinth by Tessa Afshar. So I definitely think going into this book knowing very little is going to make the reading experience a lot better. So all I will say is that we have a girl named Ariadne who basically ends up living with her mother and grandfather in Athens and she's extremely unhappy. She also lives there with her brother and her sort of brother. He's not like officially adopted but he um, is basically like her brother and so they decide to run away and they run away to Corinth, which is where her father lives. And 
Once there, she basically finds out that her father is a thief and that he has been stealing from the very wealthy of Corinth. And so Ariadne kind of follows in his footsteps. Along the way, they meet some characters that are featured in the New Testament. So this is also an early church biblical fiction. And oh my gosh, this is one of my favorite books of all time. I absolutely love Ariadne and just her personality. She's so stubborn. She reminds me so much of myself. I really enjoyed rereading this and the themes are, are very important in this book. And I think Tessa Afshar is an amazing author. So yeah, I would highly recommend this book as well. Okay, so finally, the last book of the month. This is actually the last book I read and my favorite book of this month of March. And I, I think I'm going to have to film a video where I just blabber. Like it's not even gonna be a book review. I'll probably call it like a book gush or something because I will not be able to like organize my thoughts into coherent sentences. Like this book destroyed me. And that is The Hero of Ages by Brandon Sanderson. I have finished the Mistborn Era 1 trilogy and I'm not okay. Oh my goodness, okay. So the first book takes place in this world where there are people that can ingest metals and they have magical abilities. They're called mistings if they have magical abilities based off of one metal, but if they can use all the metals, they're called Mistborn. So the first book is about Vin who discovers that she's Mistborn and she joins this crew and their ultimate goal is to overthrow the Lord Ruler. And he is basically like the evil emperor, evil being that has um, taken control of the world and they want to overthrow him, they want to kill him. And so the whole first book is basically um, them trying to overthrow the Lord Ruler. The second book uh, continues from obviously where the first book ended, big cliffhanger. Um, but the first book ended in a way that I wasn't expecting. And then the second book is a lot more military army focused. And then this book, oh my, oh my Lord. Oh my gosh. Okay. If you have not read the first two books in the series, this is where you stop watching the video because I'm going to get a little bit into spoilers for the first two books, not for this one. So if you have not read any like the first two books in the Mistborn trilogy, then sorry, this is where I continue talking about the trilogy and it will be a little spoilery. So um, thanks for watching up until now, though. <laughs> Anyways, so the first two books, um, you know, when the Lord Ruler was killed and then he's like, this is bad. Like you made a really big mistake by killing me because he knew, he knew that if he dies, something is gonna happen. And then the second book, you get Vin trying to find the Well of Ascension, right? And then at the end, when she does, and then something is released, that's like, that's where this book, this, uh, book picks up basically. And the ending of the Well of Ascension was just so intense with Ellen becoming misborn, and I thought Ellen was dead, but then he wasn't. And oh, my brain, oh my gosh. And so we have this creature now that Vin released from the Well of Ascension. And he's just wreaking havoc in the world in this book. Like the world is literally going to end if something doesn't happen, if, if someone doesn't save them, if we don't have a hero of ages stepping up. And that's what this book is about. Will the hero of ages defeat this creature, this being man the sense of doom in this book and then the way it ends <sighs> amazing i am not a crier like with books i just i don't ever cry really except for like some very few exceptions the last three chapters of this book had me sobbing like i i locked my bedroom door i'm like no one is coming in here because i just need to cry and i was just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing because I didn't, I didn't expect to be so attached to the characters and then the ending and just, it was majestic and emotional and amazing. And <sighs> this is the first um, like epic fantasy trilogy I've ever read. So I am not like well-versed in fantasy in general, especially epics and like talking about world building and magic systems and all that. But let me tell you, the characters are what make this trilogy. 
super character driven, but also amazing plot lines and oh, okay, that that's all I can say. That's all I can say because this video is already probably gonna be like an hour long. And yeah, I will try to make a separate video where I really, really get into my thoughts about like the different parts of this book and specifically the ending because I have stuff to say, but it won't be a very organized video. But yeah, that is the last book I read of in March and wow, wow, it blew me away. If you guys have stuck around until the end of this video, bless your heart, bless your souls. You guys, I'm sorry, this was really long. My mouth is dry, I need to go drink some water. But again, thank you so much for watching. And if you've read any of these books, I want to know and I want to know what you thought. Um, but yeah, I read a little bit too much in March, I think. I think I need to uh, slow down my reading a little bit. Had a bit of a mixed bag again, but the books that really stood out to me, the books that I absolutely adored, I adored with all my heart. So that is it for my March wrap up. Thank you again for watching. And I hope you guys are all doing amazing. I hope you're all doing well wherever you are in the world. And I hope to see you all in my next video. Bye.